Uh, and so basically, we also, look, when we look at the tow pilots, I think it's roughly 90, 95% overlap between the tow pilots that serve Evergreen as well as serve SGC. Um, and I think there are a few that also work down at PSSA down at Barracks Um, But Barracks is also kind of running into a, a bit of a challenge. They've got about 200 hours left on their engine before it needs to be overhauled. And so there's a crunch in that. And we're also trying to figure out a way of how do you go about checking out tow pilots and making sure that they're good for the currency. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we have a lot to think about here. And with the glider end of it, I'm really excited that Noel has just, uh, offered up to give this uh, talk and try and get people to start thinking about getting back in the cockpit again and doing it safely. And then also, what are you going to set for your goals for this year? And uh, anyways, uh, Noel, if you're ready, I'll pass it off to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, <clears throat> looking forward to this. Um, I'm going to check and see. I'm sorry, if I Noel, can I interrupt for a minute? Yeah, go for it. Before you get started, um, I just wanted to clear up a couple of things, make, uh, have a couple of things. As far as the election results, uh, we had two, two uh, other people on the board, uh, or three other people on the board. Noel, Noel is a board member now. Uh, we also got Henry Rebick, uh, flies up at Arlington. He's a board member now. And Mobsis is back. So Yeah, Mobsis, thank you. That's thank right. You. I, my apologies. I, I... Okay. Uh, the other thing... Uh, I wanted to mention beforehand, uh, we can talk about this later, is the dates of what events are coming up this summer. Uh, just some for, I believe they're already in the calendar, but I can't uh, promise it. Uh, TBD, somewhere around the 1st of May, latter part of April, open up the uh, clubhouse. Uh, Dust Up is the Memorial Day weekend, scheduled for the 28th through the 30th. Uh, Evergreen Encampment is scheduled for May 31st through June 5th. A uh, week after that, uh, the Whitaker Encampment, uh, that is open to members. And then the Region 8 contest is June 26th through July 2nd. Uh, and we're in the process of working on getting that all scare, uh, scheduled and, and uh, getting the uh, sanctioning by SSA. Anyway, that's all I wanted to add in before we got going. Thank you, Mike. All right. Perfect. Thank you, Mike. That actually allowed me to add a small thing to my presentation that I uh, forgot to add. So <laughs> good information and, and buying me some time. I appreciate it. No problem. Uh, Are you ready to be a host? I am ready to be a host. Done. Bring it on. You got it. <laughs> good evening, everybody. Um, as you can see, I'm coming to you from uh, my lovely, slightly messy and uh, dog observed office. Uh, I'm going to apologize right now. I'm dealing with a bit of a uh, screaming headache tonight. So if I'm not at my best, I apologize. Also, that means that uh, I would very much appreciate audience participation tonight. Uh, if you have a question or concern during this, uh, feel free and um, uh, raise your hand, which uh, should be available under the little reactions button on your Zoom client. Uh, and also uh, at the end of each of these slides that I'm gonna go over where we cover an area or a topic of safety, I am sure there are bullets that I didn't put out, things I didn't think of, good ideas that some of you are gonna have. And I'd appreciate you bringing those up. Shout them out, type them into chat. Uh, the more information, the more variety of information we have for folks here, the better we all are when it comes to safety. So don't hold back. And with that, I will go ahead and share my screen uh, like so. And uh, I will say that if you um, see me um, 
looking off this way, that's because this is where the other monitor is. It's got the presentation. So I'm not trying to avoid eye contact or anything with you guys. Uh, all right, so let's talk about getting back in the saddle or returning to flight and safely achieving your 2022 soaring goals. Um, as, uh, as Jim mentioned, some of us will be returning to um, returning to flight here after just the typical, you know, two, three, four months off for winter. Some of us might be taking, uh, have, have taken a longer time off. Some of us might not have flown since before COVID. Uh, and I really wanted this to be a general discussion of this topic and some various aspects to think about so that no matter what length of time you've taken off, um, these tips and, and thoughts will help keep you safe and make you successful in your soaring. Uh, I say achieving your 2022 soaring goals, but yeah, again, hopefully this is uh, good information uh, for the long haul for everybody. So let's start. And I am having a hard time getting a little thing out of the way here. Pardon me. There we go. All right. Uh, let's start talking a little bit about uh, how this is going to break down tonight. Uh, first, we're going to talk about checking your gear. Uh, if you are Refamiliarizing yourself with uh, flying, you're probably also refamiliarizing yourself with your various uh, uh, components and paperwork and all the little things that go into uh, flying beyond just the aircraft. But then, of course, you will need to check your aircraft um, and think about its condition, wear items, all that sort of stuff. You need to check yourself. Uh, we'll talk about this in detail, but you know, skills and, and uh, um, knowledge is not permanent. These things degrade over time if we don't practice them. So if you have been taking time off, um, you're going to need to work on yourself just as much as your equipment, if not more. And you want to check each other. Uh, not only because uh, this is a social sport and we enjoy the camaraderie, but working with each other helps us cover our, our various gaps. And it also is a good way for us to help keep each other safe. Next, check your goals, uh, because goals can be a really, really good way to get um, focus and structure and help you work through things uh, that might otherwise be sort of either an overwhelming sea of things to do or a discouraging um, uh, sort of uh, high level view, if you will. If you think that you know, it's going to take a lot of work to get back to soaring where you want to soar or the level of skill you want to have. Um, it can seem awfully far away. And if you don't have any kind of structure, um, that can be very discouraging. But once you put goals and structure into place, it can really help move you through the process and get you to where you want to go much faster than you might otherwise think. I will note, all of this takes weeks or even months. And it's really important to plan ahead and to start early. Um, you're going to run into hiccups when you start looking at gear and airplane stuff. And you might need to order a part or wait on a BFR or wait on an annual or whatever. And if you wait until late to do those things, you are going to either A, get discouraged, or B, feel the pressure to push through things and rush through things to still achieve some kind of arbitrary timeline. And every time you do that, you're shaving your safety margins down. And if you're starting from a place where you're out of practice or you haven't flown over the winter um, or you, you know, have a, a deficiency in some area or your life has changed or whatever it may be, um, you don't want to shave those margins any thinner than they're already starting. So start early and take your time. And I'll circle back to this at the end, but remember that your goals can include this process of preparation and getting back into flight um, and treat those things as milestones and as things you can celebrate along the way, even if they aren't happening in the cockpit. So your gear, I'm gonna list out some gear here and we're gonna talk through some of these things. Some of this is probably gonna be very obvious. Some of this might be things that you don't normally think of as your gear. Uh, for example, registration and logbooks. Uh, these are, you know, gear items, if you will, because they help track key things about you and your aircraft, such as when your annual inspection is due, when your pilot BFR is due. A lot of people lump this under the airplane category. I don't because uh, 
one, they don't do any good just sitting in your airplane. And two, again, they really are key in tracking both the airplane and your status. We've got to think about both when we're talking about this topic. Uh, parachutes, pretty obvious one. Uh, when was it last repacked? Also, how's it doing over its life? And where has it been stored in this time you've been taking off? Um, we'll cover this in the aircraft side of things as well, but you know, storage doesn't mean things are not aging, things can't get damaged, um, you know, mold and mildew, uh, high humidity, cold temperatures, depending on where you store things, they might still get damaged. And you need to think about how they're aging while they're stored. You also need to plan for time that if you pull something that's been stored um, in a closet, in a workshop, at an offsite storage facility, in a clubhouse, uh, in a hangar for the last X months, you have to plan on some time, some contingency time for you discovering that, oh, mice got in here, or, oh, there was a water leak, or those kinds of things. Uh, clothing and protective gear. Um, sunglasses get lost. Uh, clothes wear out. Uh, sunscreen goes nasty, and you don't want to put it on your skin after a while if it goes nasty. Uh, all these things need to be thought about and refreshed. Hydration and relief equipment. Uh, seals on camelbacks go bad. Um, your, uh, you know, if you use an external catheter, the glue on your current supply might have aged out, and it's not going to do a good job sticking. And uh, yeah, that's a mess in the cockpit, right? So, have you checked these things? How fresh are they? How new are they? Uh, your O2 system components. Again, a lot of people lump this into the airplane side of things, but you know it's perfectly possible on a lot of aircraft with oxygen systems to pull the various components out of the aircraft. Uh, I definitely take mine uh, back to my house with me over the winter, for example, because then I can, anytime I get the urge, I can go look in the garage. What's the date on the bottle? When does it have to be hydro tested? I don't have to worry about driving all the way up to the uh, the airport to look and find out, right? Or get to the airport at the beginning of the season and realize, oh crap, now I got to take all this apart and go take it, get hydro tested. Um, there's batteries in your O2 systems, there's hoses, there's cannulas that might be getting old or nasty or need replacing, right? All these things need to be checked ahead of time. Uh, increasingly, we have uh, modern avionics in our gliders that require some care and feeding. We'll talk about that a little bit more in the um, aircraft side of things, but we also have sometimes handheld avionics, handheld radios, um, portable flarm systems, uh, backup gauges, uh, things we might use with an iPad or an iPhone or a smartphone. Um, those things need to be checked ahead of time. And since they're not a permanent part of the aircraft, uh, you should consider them gear that you need to check uh, wow. and make sure they're good. Sorry, did somebody just say something? spot uh yep i'm getting there okay. <laughs> that's a, definitely a good one uh your spot your in reach um you know plb whatever it is it's a really good one uh, your land out kit contents this is kind of a, a details category uh so i shamelessly copied a list of land out equipment or uh, land out kit components excuse me and i'm going to show it here in a minute but a lot of the land out kit components might age out right if you've got uh, emergency rations, um, you know, fire starters, other things like that. Uh, you got to check and make sure are they still good? Did they get too wet? Uh, have they aged out? Are they, you know, all these sorts of things. So here's just a, you know, like I said, a quick list. And you know, before you get into flying, even if you haven't taken a layoff from soaring, this would be a good thing to check and and double check and make sure you have all these things in there in good condition. Also, a lot of these things have batteries that go bad and can go, you know, south during the season. So when it comes to things like your land out kit and your handheld avionics, portable avionics, uh, those things you should definitely check periodically throughout the season. Um, that's not a getting back into soaring thing, but it's just a good practice, good habit. So might as well embed that early. Um, on the topic of gear, almost everything is perishable or uh, wears out over time, right? So here is a whole bunch of photos of gear along the lines of what I've talked about, including a couple of things I haven't yet, like charts. Um, and basically everything 
on this screen that you see wears out or is perishable, right? Some of it wears out in months, some of it wears out over a decade, but all of it has a, a, a little clock ticking next to it. And if you haven't recently gone through this stuff, this is a good place to start refamiliarizing yourself with soaring and with these skills by building up that mental list of what's fresh, what needs to be replaced. And in the process of going through all of this gear, you'll also be refamiliarizing yourself with how it works, how to use it, how to configure it, right? Um, okay, maybe the sunglasses, you don't forget how to operate. Maybe the bucket hat's second nature, but uh, you know your bailout kit, your spot, your parachute, all these things, just the act of pulling it out, adjusting it, trying it on, turning it on, figuring out how fresh or how old it is, that will help you get back into these subjects and help get you back in the mindset of getting ready to soar. Before we go on to aircraft, does anybody else have anything in terms of gear they think is good to check um, you know, pre-season or after a layoff? All right, cool, we'll keep it rolling. All right, <clears throat> even if you fly a club ship, it's really important to take the time to refamiliarize yourself with the plane, the trailer, and the gear. Um, we have a mix of private owners, syndicate owners, and club pilots uh, uh, with all of our, our flying and our activities. And I think it's important that just because you don't personally own the aircraft, you shouldn't abdicate your knowledge and your responsibility. Um, you're still the pilot in command when you're in the air. You're still responsible for retrieving the glider. If it's you know landed out, you need to use the trailer. Um, you're still responsible for using the gear that comes with the aircraft and trailer to rig and de-rig safely, to assemble and disassemble the aircraft safely. So it's really important to be familiar with those things even if you rarely use them like the trailer at a, at a club glider port. And again, going through these steps, even if everything's in good condition and it's a club ship that's been recently flying, will help you refresh your mental library on these topics and their proper operation and safety. So things like, do you know offhand when your next annual inspection is due for, for the aircraft you're about to fly or that you typically fly? Uh, what's the condition of the batteries? Not only are they charged, but how many do you have? How old are they? Do any need to be replaced in the next months or year? Uh, upholstery, like I said, um, you know, I had a, a very uh, nasty surprise the first year I had my own glider and I left it in the trailer over winter at Arlington. And even though the trailer was relatively watertight, uh, the high humidity being parked on grass meant that the inside of the trailer got pretty moist and I had a much fuzzier cockpit when I opened the trailer up in February uh, than I had put it away in in December. So again, just because something's in storage doesn't mean it's not being exposed to potential sources of damage, doesn't mean it's not aging, that clock is always ticking. So. When's the last time you've looked at your upholstery? And I'm not just talking about damage, but I'm also talking about like fit. Uh, is the upholstery and the cushions in the, in the glider still comfortable for you at your current size and weight? Uh, was there a lingering problem last time you flew it that maybe you should address before you go back to flying? Um, and how you fit in the glider cockpit, again, helps you think through the ergonomics and the safety of flight itself. Avionics, uh, you know, especially if you have any complex system in your aircraft, um, the button and switchology of that, uh, that system is very fungible knowledge. It can, it can age out pretty quickly if you're not practicing it. So it's important to refamiliarize yourself with that. Either if you've got like a computer simulator, you can run some of the avionics allow you to run a, a version of it on a computer. Or if you can you know, go to the glider port or go to wherever your aircraft is, stick a battery in, flip it on, run through some menus and things, refamiliarize yourself with it. I'm gonna wear that, that word out by the end of this presentation, but I'm not sorry. Uh, in addition to that, you can see I've listed here 
some various things that you're going to want to check to make sure that it's going to be safe and fully functional throughout the soaring season. Increasingly, with our electronics, they have uh, firmware updates, bug fixes, and things that need to be loaded or updated every single season. So it's important to think about that. I've known plenty of people who fly with the power flarm who don't think about updating the flarm firmware until the day or two after. Uh, people start going, hey, I stopped seeing you on flarm yesterday. What's going on? And the annual you know, date has passed and the person hasn't upgraded their firmware. And unfortunately, if you're not flying with somebody who thinks to tell you that, you might be flying around with a false sense of security um, thinking that other people are seeing you when they're not. So paying attention to this stuff is not just important from a, I'm getting myself back into soaring standpoint, but also in terms of the safety of others that you're sharing the airspace with. Gliders have a lot of wear items. We tend to think of gliders as being so much lower maintenance than powered airplanes. And you know, as long as the wings and tail are on and as long as the control surfaces are good and the push rods and, and cables and pulleys are all good, then hey, it's fine. But it's not so straightforward. There are lots of subtle wear items that take many years to wear out, so they're easy to forget about. And it's important, especially if you've taken some time off from flying, but even in a normal situation, but especially if you've taken some time off from flying, that you go over those items and really understand what condition they're in. Like I said here, tires, brakes, not just the brake drums and, and pads, but also the fluid and the reservoirs and the hoses, right? Um, any springs or struts on the canopy or the landing gear or whatever. Um, all your hinges, your toe release mechanisms, your mylar seals and safety tapes. Um, all of these things wear out over time and it's easy to lose track of them. Oh, and, I'm going to throw one other thing on your glider wear items. Yeah, go for is, it. It's your, uh, for a lot of people that have uh, hinged canopies that uh, open to the side, check that canopy uh, catch on because a lot of times as that's wearing over the years, it only takes one of those things to break and there goes 8,000 bucks in a soaring season. Uh, but that is a wear item that comes up that you should be checking uh, at least once a year. Good point. Latches and the emergency release parts of them too. Uh, all good stuff. Thank you for calling that out. Um, so yeah, and again, uh, not to sound like a broken record, but just taking this time to step through all these different aircraft systems will help you get mentally back in the game and will refresh you on a lot of topics that are related to these items. Similarly, there's lots of wear items on a trailer. Lots of them only go bad over a period of many years. So we're not used to maintaining them very regularly. I have had more than one experience with this myself, I will be the first to raise my hand and say, I tend to neglect parts of my trailer until they don't leave me any option. And as you'll see in a minute, that's a bad thing. <laughs> you don't want the trailer to be telling you in no uncertain terms that you're stopping now, no matter where in the world you are, and you're going to fix this thing because otherwise you're going to be dragging a hunk of sparking metal down the freeway behind you. And then I've got this category I've labeled aids and accessories. Uh, we don't just have a glider and a trailer. We all have additional things that we use that's often stored in the trailer, but is equipment that needs to be maintained in its own right. So you got wing stands, wing riggers, chocks, grease tapes, all the things you see there listed and plenty more. What's the status of these things? How many do you have? Uh, are they in good condition? You, know, you really don't want that wing stand with the, the little pin for its position, wearing, 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 and then you go to put a wing on it and it snaps and your wing falls down and slams on the ground. And like Jim said, there's a couple thousand bucks in your soaring season, right? And again, if it's been a while since you've rigged a, a glider, you know, starting out by re-examining your wing rigging tools will help refresh your memory on these things and help you get back in the groove on them. Lastly on this slide, 
a strong suggestion slash urging of you guys. I put tip here because I couldn't figure out a better way to put it. The first time you're going to start thinking and working on these things on the glider and the trailer, don't go out there and the first thing you see that's a wear item, start working on it. Because what's going to happen is you're going to spot two or three other things, but you're going to get lost in one thing. And by the time you've finished fixing or maintaining or working on this one thing, you've forgotten one of the two or three others. Instead, don't focus on fixing it first. Focus on documenting first. Take a notepad, walk from front to back, do a thorough pre-flight inspection on the glider, and make a list of all the where items you can think of and see. Make a list of all the items you're concerned about. Then you have built yourself essentially a checklist that you can go back and hit one by one. And this again goes back to the idea of providing structure. It goes back to the idea of improving your safety by making sure you're not missing things. And again, <laughs> you will be refreshing yourself on these things, right? If you focus on checking the elevator connection mechanism, you're probably also gonna remember the tales you've been told about what happens if you don't properly hook up the elevator when you rig the glider. And that in of itself will refresh you on some things about that and hopefully lead into emergency procedures and other things that you know, can uh, expand out from there. But these serve as good little you know, ping points in your brain that will provide value. As I've said a couple of times, and I'm gonna reemphasize here, long lasting wear items are insidious because we go through two, three, four soaring seasons and we stop thinking about these items because they are never a problem until they are. This was uh, my first or second trip back. I think this was my first trip back in 2010 from Logan, Utah. And I happened to be hustling back to Seattle and I was about five miles outside of Twin Falls, Idaho at 2 a.m. in the morning when one of my trailer tires blew, ripped the fender off of the trailer and put me on the side of the road in the middle of the dark in Idaho at 2 a.m. when the only other people on the road were drunk. And it was the tire on the highway side that I had to change. And as you can imagine, that was not a fun experience. Uh, in the mode of a confessional, the worst part was not only had I not been keeping track of how badly this tire was getting worn, and it was, by the way, sun exposure, not tread wearing down. For those of you that haven't been lectured on this topic, it's important to note that tires degrade as they are exposed to the atmosphere in the sun. So there can be tons of tread left on the tire, and it'll still blow on you if it's too old. My double sin, to put it that way, was not only had I not been watching this tire and monitoring its age carefully enough, but I had also stopped paying attention to how much air was in the spare tire that was underneath my glider fuselage in the middle of the trailer. So I actually had to pull my entire glider out of the trailer, get a tire out from underneath the glider fuselage, figure out how to air it up at least partly, then mount it, then limp to a gas station all at 3 a.m. Don't be me. <laughs> Check this stuff before the soaring season. Keep an eye on it. Don't let it get away from you. Now, just to prove that uh, you can be a reasonably accomplished pilot and still be really dumb multiple times, this was my glider main tire on day one of the Nationals at Nephi this year. This was as I was pulling onto the grid to launch and my main tire lost air because the tube uh, had gotten old and split inside the tire, but of course, instantly lost pressure. And when you have a glider that's fully loaded with water ballast um, on soft dirt and the tire goes flat, you ain't moving. Uh, it took multiple hours to repair. I got a zero on the contest day, and it took me from what would have been like a sixth or eighth place finish in nationals down to like a 20th place, 20th place finish, even though I was able to compete the whole rest of the time and do reasonably well. And um, there are mitigation strategies and things you can do around some of this stuff. I'm not gonna get into that tonight in terms of spares and whatnot, but I will just say that if I had stopped to think about the fact that this was a 2007 glider and that the previous owner 
had never changed the main tire tube, I might have thought to change it before it got to be, what, 14 years old. Um, but it's inside a tire. The tire looks good. It's been reliable for year after year after year after year. It's easy to forget. So these are the kinds of things to pay attention to at any point, but especially if you haven't been looking through the aircraft, you haven't been flying it recently, make sure to stop and think about this. And if you don't know when something was replaced, then maybe you ought to put it on a list of things to replace sooner rather than later. That might even become one of your goals for your soaring season. And then document that date in a logbook, maybe. I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, so then you always have a date to refer back to, and you can keep on top of it better in the future. Speaking of keeping on top of things, next topic, unless somebody has something they want to talk about in terms of glider trailer or glider. Awesome. Checking yourself. Uh, and I have uh, been a little uh, redundantly redundant there with my title. Um, but uh, you can never be too sure, right? First things first, BFR is at a legal minimum, right? When we soar, we are doing something that is potentially life ending. It's not necessarily a huge risk. It doesn't have to be a big risk, but the risk of death, like almost any major activity or sport, exists. You don't ever want your epitaph to read, he did the minimum, or she did the minimum, or they did the minimum, right? That's just not a good place to start, right? So think about what you can do beyond BFRs. Um, there is so, so much more. And again, BFRs are there as an opportunity to practice a few things, to ask a few questions, to be loosely evaluated, to make sure there's not an obvious reason you should stay out of the sky. They are not true training in the classical sense, and they are not intended, nor were they designed, to take you from a, um, a non-current, non-recent level of flight skill to fully current and heavily skilled, right? That is not the role they play at all. Um, mental skills, I said this before, I'm going to say it again, mental skills, physical dexterity, and your response to emergencies, all those things atrophy when you don't use them and when you don't practice them, okay? So if you haven't practiced an emergency in a little while, guess what? Your emergency response is going to suck, even if you have been flying. Uh, if you've been doing a ton of reading and a ton of thinking about soaring and weather and emergencies, that's great. That doesn't mean your hand-eye coordination and your stick and rudder skills are actually going to be that good. These are separate things you have to focus on, think about, and exercise. On the mental side of things, ask yourself when the last time was that you cracked open the glider handbook or the training syllabus. Now, I'm not recommending that you read through those things from start to finish because this is about how to regain your skills, not how to fall asleep at night. But you don't have to read these things in order. You can crack it open to a chapter and just skim it. Uh, and pick a chapter that's interesting, or pick a chapter that seems like it's safety related, or pick a chapter that covers something you haven't done in a long time. If you haven't practiced stalls recently, go look at a chapter on stalls. If you haven't practiced thermaling in a while, go look at a chapter on thermaling, right? You don't have to follow it in order. You don't have to read the whole, the whole thing. But it is really easy to fool yourself into thinking you know something when you don't really know it or when you've forgotten it. Because as you read, as you review something, it will become familiar again to you, and your brain's going to start going, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I know this. Yeah, 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 whatever. Sure. Yeah, I got this. Yeah, I remembered about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But that's only because it's being prompted by the words on the page or perhaps a conversation you're having with an instructor or whatever. If you were to come up, try to come up with that same information in a vacuum, it might be a very different story. Okay, and I will say, um, in my experience, uh, both as as somebody who's an accomplished engineer and somebody who manages other people, and I say this with no malice, um, the smarter you are, the easier it is to fool yourself about this stuff. All right, 
So be very cautious and cognizant of this capability that we have to fool ourselves. And as I say here, what I suggest you do, the real acid test of whether you know something or not is like in my previous example, grab the FAA glider handbook, flip to the table of contents, pick a chapter and try without looking at the chapter to summarize the topic, to explain the key points just aloud. Be like, oh yeah, stalls. Uh, uh, exceeding angle of attack, uh, flow separation, you know, blah, 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 right? Spend three minutes and talk through it. Uh, it can happen in any attitude. It can happen in any airspeed. There's accelerated stalls, blah, 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 right? Cover the topic the best you can completely unprompted. Then crack the book open to that page, skim through, see if there's things you're missing. Or you might find as you try to explain it, you start stumbling or you start going, oh yeah, how did I know, know that? Or how did they say that? That is your reminder, hey, I've forgotten some things here, and that's a good thing to uncover, right? Not being able to explain these topics doesn't indicate failure. It reinforces that you're doing the right thing, that you're refreshing yourself, and that learning that thing is important. And that's going to encourage you to then actually go and read that material. If you just skim it and go, yeah, 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 I know it, I know it, I know it, guess what? It's going in your eyeballs and out your butt, and it's not staying anywhere in the middle. If you realize, oh, I stumbled on that, or oh, I'm skimming this and I didn't say that aloud, that's then gonna stick in your brain better and that's gonna make you a safer, more um, um, refreshed, if you will, pilot when you actually go out to do the flights. Again, take a stepwise approach, build your knowledge and skills back incrementally. Um, the longer you've been out, sort of the earlier in the syllabus you should start some. And when I say earlier in the syllabus, I don't mean earlier necessarily in chapter order, but I mean in terms of skills and knowledge order. Uh, in aviation, especially in soaring, right, it's layers of knowledge. You have to understand aerodynamics before you can understand aircraft control. You have to understand aircraft control before you can understand thermaling uh, and what you, how you perform a thermaling turn. You have to understand thermaling and weather before you can understand how to effectively climb in a thermal, right? So all this stuff stacks. The longer you've been out, the more you need to unstack that knowledge and get back to the core bits and then start reassembling those pieces together. And some pieces are going to go together fast. Other pieces are going to take a little bit more refresher, and that's okay. The key is to find out which ones are going together easily and which ones you need to pay attention to. One big thing here where we shift from the mental to the physical, one big thing that it's the goofiest thing in the world to do in front of an audience, but it is absolutely, I 100% believe this, one of the best things you can do is to chair fly. Okay, You get to practice the mental skills. You get to practice the physical skills. You're practicing, if you're saying things aloud, which I highly recommend, you're practicing auditory learning by you're talking to yourself. You're also checking yourself because verbalizing what you're doing and what's happening around you ensures that you can actually put the whole sequence together in your head. And it's kinesthetic learning because you're making motions with your hands and with your body language while you're reciting this stuff. It's engaging your whole mind and body, practicing both physical and mental skills. So one of the things that I really highly recommend you do, especially when you're trying to get back into the swing of things, is to set up little scenarios, right? Maybe you've been out for a long time, great. Imagine yourself on downwind at the exact right height at the exact right speed. Start from that easy position, talk your way through the whole landing pattern and what you're gonna do. Okay, now reset back to that spot throw in a little bit of a crosswind. Which direction is it coming from? How are you going to correct it, right? Now you're throwing in a little bit of skills. Um, you know, are you looking for that wind sock? Do you remember how to do a slip? All those sorts of things, right? Do you do it to the proper direction? Um, maybe you haven't been out that long. So, okay, chair fly an emergency situation. Chair fly a really nasty, bumpy thermal that's knocking you around. Chair fly flying in a gaggle. How are you going to deal with a person who's flying slower in front of you? Whatever the scenario may be, tailor it to your recency and your level of skill. And the nice thing about doing this just in your head, not even in a computer simulator, is the setup is instantaneous. You can come up with a scenario and there's no faffing about with the computer. There's no making sure the joystick is set up right. It's just set it up in your head, close your eyes and go. If you have a SIM, if you're comfortable with a SIM, if it's been properly configured, I say that's also a good option. 
Uh, it's perfectly uh, acceptable. Certainly the nice thing about a SIM is the SIM's not gonna let you cheat as much as you can in your own brain, right? In your own brain, you're probably always going to make the maneuver fast enough, right? Even if it takes you a moment to go right, no left, I'm gonna go left, you know? And in the SIM, you've got a little bit more constancy of timing and sequencing and stuff like that. So it's got its own unique value, but there is no need for a SIM here. You can accomplish many of the same tasks chair flying that you can with a SIM when it comes to refreshing your skills and your knowledge and talking yourself through some of these core fundamental aspects of flying and emergencies and being safe. Another thing to keep in mind, uh, this can start to sound like a whole lot of work, but the nice thing about soaring is that it is multidisciplinary, right? So you don't have to just sit there and study aerodynamics and then stalls and then slips and then, oh my God, you're done dealing with the, the rudder and ailerons for a while, right? You've just been hammering, hammering, hammering. You don't have to do that, right? You can take a little bit of time and go jump and look at some weather stuff. You can go jump and look at some cross-country planning stuff, right? You need to be careful not to be too scattershot in your approach because see my previous bullet point about you know, taking a stepwise approach, but you can use this to keep the, the, the progression fresh, right? You don't just have to hammer down one line of inquiry and get bored to tears with it. You can approach things from different angles, stop, take a breath, think about something new and keep fresh while you keep at it. I'll point out right at the end, one that uh, probably hardly any of us think about and probably don't practice enough, even if we are current in flighters, and that's air traffic control comms. When the la when's the last time you thought through a scenario, did a little chair flying of coming into class D airspace? Uh, maybe it's Moses Lake, um, maybe it's Payne Field, you know, you're flying out of Arlington, you get way south, whatever the case may be, right? When's the last time you had to ask uh, for clearance into an airspace or get tower contact verified so you can come and land at their, their towered field, right? Um, that can be awfully intimidating in the in the real world if you haven't practiced it recently. So, you know, something to think about even for those of us that have flown recently. Anything I haven't covered on this that uh, folks want to talk about in terms of checking yourself and practicing on your own? Sorry about that. I had a little headset problem. Uh, I see that, um, I think it, uh, yeah, Craig Reinhold actually was talking about uh, his uh, trailer brake drum uh, having a marginal uh, repair um, on chat there. Uh, good stuff, Craig. Thanks for sharing. Uh, great reminder for all of us that keeping on top of that stuff is, is better than letting it go for sure. All right. Uh, I'm going to throw one more in here. I'm going to back it up and make it reappear in case people didn't see it. Hey, speaking of checking yourself, something that we don't always think about in the glider world because we don't need an aviation medical. Uh, when's the last time you got a physical? When's the last time you had an eye exam and got your prescription updated? Uh, any other health issues you have just generally in your life that you've been tracking? Maybe they're well controlled. Maybe it's no big deal. But when's the last time you actually checked up on those things? If you haven't been flying in a while, or even if you have, this is one of those insidious things, right? <laughs> the human body is a long-term wear item just as much as some of our gear. And uh, we have to keep that in mind. Um, you know, uh, I actually might be flying with glasses here come this season, uh, because now that I'm in my mid forties, uh, I've been flying for 15 years and it's getting to the point where oh, my eyes just aren't quite as good as they used to be. Uh, and, um, you know, especially if you haven't been flying recently, you'd rather go into that knowing that you've either got a clean bill of health or knowing exactly the situation than having unknowns floating out there, right? Or having something that's slowly going downhill on you that you don't realize. Um, and then it really comes to a head when you're out flying. So check yourself in terms of your health. And, you know, self-evaluate, 
but also potentially get checked as well. All right, I don't wanna beat on this too much, but atrophied emergency skills are insidious. If you have not practiced them, even if you are a current glider pilot, and I know we've got some current glider pilots in the audience tonight, if you haven't practiced emergencies, if you haven't thought about emergencies, those skills atrophy and that can become insidious because you think you're prepared when you're not. So I'm gonna throw up a few photos that I found online very quickly, just as a reminder about this. And I promise I'm not gonna hit on this too hard, but I think it's very important to cover. Stall spins. When's the last time you did a spin recovery? When's the last time you practiced and double, triple checked that your turns in the pattern are absolutely coordinated, that you're not falling into a pattern of overshooting final and having to correct back and trying to do it with the rudder uh, or, you know, not thinking about crosswinds on landing or head, you know, tailwinds on landing that might uh, cause a stall spin accident. So think about that. What do you do? How do you practice recovering from those? What are the warning signs so you can not even get into those situations? These are things to think about and practice, whether you're recent or not. Off-field landing skills. Um, there have been a few, if you watch YouTube at all and you're onto any YouTube uh, glider channels, uh, there's a couple out there where, where uh, glider folks review other videos. And there's been a few posted recently where a glider makes an absolutely fine approach to landing outfield and then catches a wingtip or uh, you know target fixates on a tree or whatever and ends up destroying the glider. Um, land outs can and should be safe. You can make a safe land out but you have to think about the process and practice it ahead of time. Um, towing, towing emergencies, right? Rope breaks, kiting, losing sight of the tow plane. These are things that can happen to anybody at any time. Um, I actually had one in the last year where I floated up above the tow plane and had to release because uh, I think it was a, a, a bee or a wasp flew right at me. I was trying to ignore it inside the cockpit and it flew right at me and I just waved and closed my eyes. By the time I reopened my eyes, the tow plane was out of sight. So bang, pull the release, right? Um, if you haven't practiced that, if you haven't embedded that, are you really going to be able to act correctly when the time comes? For any of you that fly a motor glider, right? When's the last time you actually thought through the sequence and or practice sequence, excuse me, practice the sequence of what will happen if you try to relight your engine after a failed low save and it doesn't light and you have to make you know, some kind of land out with the engine out or whatever. Or when's the last time you practiced an engine out on climb out and you got the nose forward aggressively and you kept the airspeed up even though there's all that drag of that thing sitting out there in the wind no longer making noise, right? These are things that are critically important to practice, whether you're recent or not, but especially if you're not recent, because these are the things that can bite you quick if your initial reaction is not correct. So these are the things to take a little bit of extra time and set a goal to practice these things. And then celebrate that you practiced it and know that you're a safer pilot for it. Moving on from checking ourselves to checking each other. Soaring takes multiple people, right? A few of us have the luxury, not me, but a few of us here have the luxury of having a self-launcher and you are able to go down to a local airport, rig the glider, launch the glider, go have a great time solo. And that is awesome. I'm only extremely jealous, just, just uh, but it is awesome. For the vast, vast majority of us, even many folks who do have a self-launcher, a soaring operation takes multiple people. You're gonna have folks helping you rig or helping you launch or you know running a tow plane or ropes or whatever. Leverage the multiple brains at your disposal. Ask questions. Ask people uh, you know, to check you if they see any behaviors that are unsafe or they're odd. Um, it is not fun to be told that you're doing something unsafe or to be embarrassed because you've done something that maybe on hindsight was not smart. 
But embarrassment does not cost thousands of dollars. Embarrassment does not cause hospital stays, right? So it is better to be humble and to be open to feedback than it is to assume uh, an attitude that pushes people away or that makes it so that people don't want to talk to you about what they're seeing. Also, on a slightly more positive note, if you're in the launch line for an operation and you've got a little bit of time and you're not you know, number one, number two on the launch line, Talk to the pilots around you. If you haven't been flying in a while, ask them, you know, hey, what's the weather been like this season? Or, oh, you know, uh, you know, whatever you want to talk about. Hey, help me remember, what's the path when I get to this spot in the soaring area and I'm going north? Or, uh, you know, hey, have you noticed anything? You know, whatever it is, strike up a conversation, talk to them about your soaring. Talk to them about their soaring season. Uh, one, we're pilots. We like talking and BSing. But two, even storytelling can serve a purpose and can help remind us of skills and techniques that we should be thinking about. There is no shame, zero shame in asking for help, asking for a refresher, asking for a safety pilot. Um, again, we're pilots, so we have egos. That's a foregone conclusion. <laughs> oh, not Mike. Yeah, that's right. He's an exception. Uh <laughs> no, I just... I just wanted to point out uh, that the Willamette Club several years ago had a pilot literally on the launch line and the uh, wing runner, wing, uh, the launch control officer <laughs> noticed that, that for a brief period of time, they seemed very um, out of it, not, not almost catatonic, but just not, uh, not responsive to anything. And it turns out that uh, they had what's called a TIA, and it really uh, uh, gave them something to think about. And as a result, they actually stopped flying. Uh, older gentlemen, older than me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the uh, the people doing the launch, if they see something, don't be afraid to say, "Hey, let's uh, let's wait a minute here." That's a good point. Thank you. Um... Very important that uh, you're right. I've been saying pilots, but it's very important we think about all the all the folks there helping out with the op and uh, um, ground crew are just as observant and just as valuable as as uh, anybody else in terms of pointing out our 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 foibles and safety issues. Um, since I mentioned safety pilot here in this last bullet point, and Mike brought up the point of the pilot no longer flying. Um, all of us at some point will no longer be able to fly. We know that, we try not to think about it, but it is a reality. And again, it's better to hang it up while you can rather than have it hung up for you. But <laughs> we're pilots, we have egos and we don't want to admit that sometimes. Uh, it's important to have the relationships so that we can speak truth to each other. But it's also important to remember that even if you can't fly solo anymore, it doesn't mean you can't fly. We have examples in the local area of pilots who no longer fly solo, but still get up to enjoy soaring in two seaters, whether it's a local flight or some cross country soaring, it is totally possible to do. Soaring with another soaring pilot can be a heck of a lot of fun, as long as you're not fighting each other on the controls. <laughs> and as you'll see me talk about in a minute here, as long as you have clear delineation of responsibilities in the cockpit, it's a wonderful, wonderful resource that you should avail yourself of, hopefully at least a couple times a year, even if you are recent and current. So, hey, look at that. It's almost like I knew what the next bullet point was coming. Uh, I'm just going to touch on this for another moment because this phases of flight that I mentioned at the end of this bullet point is worth noting okay you might be a pilot who has not flown in a long time and maybe you're not comfortable making the landing approach and maybe you're also not comfortable in a tight thermal because your your skills are a little bit rusty that's fine ask if you can fly all the cruising portions of the flight you know you can still get a heck of a lot of stick time and as you're, you know, maneuvering and, you know, oh, we'll aim for this cloud, we'll aim for that ridge, you know, these are things where you will be an active 
pilot participant, right? And maybe with a safety pilot after you've been flying for an hour um, and you're doing that, maybe you do try to take a nice thermal. Uh, you know, when you're up high and there's there's no risk, you're not close to terrain, maybe you will get the comfort to do that. Um, as long as you talk it out ahead of time, that's fine. But the, the core point I'm saying is that it's not just, hey, I'm going to do the radios, you do the stick kind of delineation of flying. You can slice and dice, hey, uh, you take the toe, and then after we're off release, I'm going to go flash the first thermal. And then you take the first thermal, and then I'll take it after that. And then when we get down you know, to within 2,000 feet AGL, then you got the stick again, right? And we'll you know, have positive exchange of controls every time. But let's divvy up who's flying when ahead of time based on what skills we're comfortable with, what things we can work on safely. And that can be an extraordinarily useful tool. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. Another bonus of working with uh, another person, whether it's on the ground or in the air, is that it's easier to quiz each other than quiz ourselves. Um, my earlier scenario about speaking aloud on a topic and then checking it in the book, it's just as valid and sometimes easier for folks to grab a beer with another pilot or whatever your drink of choices and have somebody go, okay, well, it's been a little while. Um, talk me through thermaling, right? What do you remember about that? Or hey, what are the dangers that you can think of in flying ridge lift, right? And enumerate them. And then if you come up with some that I don't have, I'll learn something. And if I have some that you don't mention, I'll let you know. So quizzing each other is really good. In addition, flying with different people will just experience you to different ways of approaching issues. Uh, or like I said, issues you didn't think of yourself. Um, you know, uh, maybe you fly with a pilot uh, and you don't think too much about other air traffic, and they do, right? And so them asking you to keep your eyes out or pointing out other air traffic they see while you're flying will help reopen your eyes to that uh, or refresh you on, on dealing with that situation. Uh, like I said, you don't have to share a cockpit. You can help each other over beer and pizza, over a Zoom call, via email exchanges. There are a ton of ways that you can do that. Uh, you know, you could fly Condor, which unfortunately I have been remiss in doing, but I know Mike Bamberg and some other folks uh, all get together and they'll fly in the Condor simulator together and basically have a, a, a group flight around a task for an evening and help each other out that way. So lots and lots of different forums that you can use and leverage, uh, and you don't have to stick to just one. The key is to pick topics and be focused about your discussion. Uh, be focused about your shared responsibilities and address the most critical skills and aspects you need to touch up on. So this is where it does pay to put some thought and foresight into things. Uh, you can get value out of just jumping into a conversation with another pilot, but it's more productive to go, hey, Bob, can I meet up with you uh, after work on Friday? Uh, it's been a while since I've been soaring and I'm just talking to a few different people about a few different facts and, and skills and just trying to refresh my memory. And I remember you were really good at like, um, um, you know, kind of uh, crossing between the basin and the mountains. And you kind of were good about, you know, ghosting over the Columbia River and then mountain flying. And it's been a long time since I've been in the mountains. Can we just sit down for an hour and can you talk me through like some of the things and help me refresh, you know, on mountain flying, right? Perfectly, perfectly valid approach. And by setting that up and teeing up that topic, you give the other person a chance to prepare and be conscientious about it. You also give yourself some focus around what you're going to talk about and make sure you cover the topic you know, in a, in a solid manner. Uh, one final bullet point here, it doesn't have to be one on one. You know, One experienced pilot or recent pilot uh, or instructor can help multiple other pilots at the same time. Uh, hopefully, as I'm demonstrating a little bit tonight in some small way. Uh, so it's also perfectly valid if you're not a recent pilot or you've taken some time off or you're nervous about a topic, ask around, say, hey, is anybody else here just trying to get back in the swing of things? Maybe we can all get together for you know dinner or drinks or a Zoom call sometime and uh, see if there's anybody else in the club who's willing to talk on this topic or answer some questions. And we'll just have like a roundtable for a while, you know? totally, totally valid. It doesn't have to be one-on-one. -on -one. You don't have to be the lone person seeking out the lone you know, guru who's going to teach you stuff. Group settings are totally fine. Last things here. I know we're running a little bit long, so uh, I'll keep this quick. Uh, goals. Your primary goal, and I'm very serious about this, should always be 
Numero uno, end every flight with a safe landing and no damage to the glider or objects on the ground. That's it. That's the primary goal. Everything else comes out of that. Um, Mr. Reuschman, go ahead. There, I'm having trouble coming off mute. Uh, hey, one of the things that they want us to uh, push from uh, Soaring Safety Foundation is their their magnificent website. And uh, <clears throat> if you're sitting down with uh, another pilot or an instructor, they have a lot of these things they're calling scenario-based training, and they'll set you up with uh, with a situation, and then. Uh, you try and stump each other as to what do you think the main risk is here? Uh, they talk about health things. Um, yeah, you got the website right there. Yeah. So I thought I'd put a plug in for that. Uh, that's excellent. No, I haven't looked at their website in a little while. This is great stuff. Uh, I will flash this up again at the end of the presentation here because uh, I've got some for further reading resources at the end. And I definitely think people should check this one out for sure. Yeah, last year uh, it was Ingrid. Ingrid was screwing up right and left. And, and I have a good friend named Ingrid and she's, she's upset that they used her name, but it could be anybody. So <laughs> make, make it Noel or Dave or something like that. Hey, right I feel targeted. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not incorrectly, but hey. Uh, yeah, okay, good stuff. Uh, thanks a bunch, Dave, appreciate it. All right, uh, let me try to rip through this so that uh, we can uh, get to the end of the meeting. Um, for those of you that haven't seen the SMART acronym before, uh, it's used in some terrible like corporate events. Try not to hold that against it. Um, SMART goals are actually a, a really good thing. Uh, so when you're setting goals for the season, uh, try to make them, as it says here, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. Now, time-bound doesn't necessarily mean you have to pick a date or a deadline. It can be you know, something aspirational, like by the end of the season, or by the time we get to July, I will have, you know, uh, I will know everything there is to know about, you know, thermaling or whatever it may be. That's a terrible example, but there you go. Um, uh, because that, that, by the way, that's a terrible example because it's not really a measurable or achievable goal. <laughs> but like, I will have all of the tires changed on my glider trailer by July is a perfectly good SMART goal. Goals don't have to be flight oriented, as I just demonstrated. Uh, it could be getting the airplane prepared, getting your BFR completed, uh, relocating your equipment to a specific site. Um, all these things can be goals. And that's important because thinking back to the beginning of what I said, if you've got this long runway ahead of you in terms of getting back into the swing of things or having taking a long layoff, it can that that oh, but I really, really want to get to that uh, 500K flight or whatever. I'd really love to get back to that point. Or I never did a 500K flight. I'd love to get back into soaring and get to 500K. Um, that can seem an awfully long ways away. And by setting up smart but easily achievable goals along the way helps you line them up, knock them down, and progress through. Goals can be shared, right? Find somebody who's in a similar situation pair up, help each other succeed. Now, you got to be careful of peer pressure. You don't want to get their itis to have you pushing yourself or each other too hard so that you start compromising safety margins. But you can help pick each other up uh, when you're down, when you've had a bad flight and you didn't achieve a goal. Uh, it can help you in terms of having somebody to help study things with, prepare, compare notes to, uh, it's again, if you want to seek out information from a third party, having another person in your situation makes it easier for the two or more of you to then go to ask somebody something um, really handy to buddy up with somebody. And then, as I've said, stage your <laughs> I like that, Mike, a goal that is not shared or written. A goal that is not shared or written is just a wish. Absolutely true. It's got to be defined. Uh, and if it's shared with somebody else, that certainly also makes it that much more concrete. Uh, stage your goals in a progression. Like I said, start with easy and simple goals you know you can achieve, and then ramp all the way up to stretch goals over time. And I highly recommend coming up with 
with more goals than you can achieve in a year, knowing that you may not achieve them, right? Give yourself the permission to dream big because that helps you work up that progression to that goal. And if you start to set up those goals uh, and those progressions, um, even if you don't achieve them within your original goal timeline, they still exist and you can build back from them next year to where you are at the beginning of that year, right? So let's say that your goal is to build up to a 500K by the end of this season and your best flight was a 200K and you're really disappointed. Well, hey, look, you still did a whole bunch over the course of the season. You still wanna celebrate the quality that you achieved, the firsts that you achieved and not necessarily the quantity that you achieved. But the really nice thing about the fact that you didn't achieve that 500K goal is that can be you know, one of the main goals in the following year. And you can just go, hey, well now all I've got to do is get safe for the spring and get from 200K to 500K. I know I'm already capable of doing a three or four hour 200K flight. Now I just need to get that little bit extra. And how do I work those final bits? Where am I falling down? Where am I falling short? Where are the things I can improve my skills on? And it's smaller bites at the apple to make those incremental progressions towards that later goal because you're already partway down the line. So hopefully that's all helpful. Um, and again, trying to think of it as a progression, think about the quality of what you're able to achieve. Celebrating those firsts, those achievements is really important than keeping score and going, well, I set 30 goals and I, I hit 27. So damn it, I didn't get three. It's like, man, 27 things is pretty good. And if there are a couple of awesome memorable flights or really fun evenings with pilot buddies, I mean, those are worth celebrating. Those are memorable. So uh, that's about the end of what I have to talk about here tonight. Uh, I'm just going to give out a few uh, links and things for folks, and I will paste the links into chat uh, after I stop sharing my screen. Um, for those of you that want to do some further reading and think about uh, rebuilding your skills, think especially about glider safety, um, first one is Bob Wander's Soaring Books, especially the most relevant one for this topic tonight is the BFR in Spring Checkout. He goes into, a, um, it's a short book, but he covers a lot of the sort of building block knowledge and skill bits that you might need to brush up on if you haven't been flying a little while or if you've taken a long winter. Uh, it's a really good thing. I've got a couple copies and as much as I know it, I still break it out, you know, every every winter, every spring, and just thumb through it um, and try to check myself on things. Um, the Soaring Economist, SoaringEconomist.com. Um, uh, Daniel Zazen uh, from uh, back uh, east, uh, east-ish, um, has a bunch of great articles. He's got one calling uh, he calls "Responsibly Developing Your Margins." This is an excellent one for rebuilding your skills, safety, um, and also kind of pushing yourself, but not doing it in an unsafe way. Uh, experience can kill you talking about complacency once you do get current, once you have been flying again for a little while, uh, where you can get bit. And then there is um, uh, another pilot uh, named Clemens Schiepek, who uh, I've had the pleasure of flying with both of these gentlemen. Uh, who's a great pilot, has some great articles, and he posted one called The Risk of Dying Doing What We Love. And Daniel Sazen kind of took his econ economist brain and his uh, risk margin attitudes and came up with this reply article that I think is, is very good reading. Clemens's uh, website is called chessintheair.com, and he has a whole series of articles, but they're all kind of bundled up under one called Soaring Risks and Risk Mitigation. Um, I uh, totally recommend reading through all of these. Uh, they're really good stuff, uh, especially since we're still in winter here. We've still got some, some long rainy nights to get through. Um, like I said, I'll uh, quickly copy and paste these URLs into the chat here in just a minute. Um, and uh, if you get a chance, I definitely recommend checking them out uh, and thinking about them so that you can be a, a, a safer, smarter pilot as we head into hopefully what is going to be an awesome season uh, for those of us out at Afreda, uh, hopefully enjoying um, good company camaraderie maybe a few drinks out on the deck seeing sunsets like this having had wonderful safe flights 
Thanks, everybody. Any questions? No, thank you very much for giving the presentation. Uh, that was really good. Um, and I look forward to actually looking at uh, some of the articles that uh, you've presented. Uh, what I'd like to do, if there are no questions for Noel, is actually open up the floor to see if anybody has any comments or announcements that they'd like to make or uh, uh, things that uh, we just briefly want to discuss. Um, there, I, know, I know that there are some things happening uh, out there. Chris, I don't know if you're interested in uh, saying a couple of words about Arlington and the parking situation for uh, glider trailers, but uh, this might be a good time, especially if we're looking for uh, uh, potential tenants. Uh, yeah, I can uh, just give you an update. Um, Mike Delaney and I met with uh, uh, Marty at the airport last week and Evergreen is uh, going forward with uh, uh, trying to lease that pad. I believe it uh, needs to be approved and signed yet. I think it's uh, pretty much a done deal. So we're going to be looking at uh, designing tie downs and, uh, for the trailers and the gliders. And uh, It'll, I think, uh, really advance our capabilities there at Arlington Airport. So, looking forward to it. Well, I think I saw something in the email with regards to uh, basically Evergreen is taking on that pad of property, and I think they're basically on the hook for about ten thousand a year somewhere in that neighborhood, which means that they have to have at least twenty lighter uh, trailer tenants in order to break even on that. And, uh, that, yeah. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it is a, a risk. We're uh, looking at, uh, you know, each tenant would be committed to probably a, a year lease at $30 a month for the trailers and the club itself will be uh, committed to tie down spaces. So, um, but it, we feel it's doable, and uh, I think it'll be a positive thing for the glider community. Okay, and so if somebody's interested in parking a glider trailer out there, should they get in touch with you or Mike or anybody? Uh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, Mike Delaney is kind of the point man on it, so he'd be the guy to contact. But uh, yeah, if, uh, if you want to contact me, I can pass it on. So. Great, thank you. Okay, well, uh, is there anybody else that's got announcements or anything exciting? Anybody uh, pick up a new glider this year? Or uh, uh, Mike Bamber, it's great to see you online. Uh, uh, any plans for Willamette that uh, we should hear about? Hey, Jim, when you have a second, this is Brad. I'll just, uh, I got my hand up, but no hurry. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, Brad, please. A um, couple things. Hey, Noel, thanks. That was a real nice presentation. Um, you just mentioned a little bit about the medical stuff. It's kind of interesting <clears throat> in the glider community. There's kind of a little perception that you don't need a medical and you really don't have to worry about medical problems too much. But just, just a little point that in the FARs, it does say that for anyone exercising the privileges of a pilot certificate where a medical is not required, there's still certain requirements you have to meet. You know, you can't have anything going on that would interfere with your being, um, you know, fully capable of exercising the privileges of your, of your certificate. So that's 6153 um, paragraph B. So just keep in mind that there are specific medical requirements. Well, there may be more general medical requirements for glider pilots. And the balloon pilot business, they're getting hit by the FAA right now, as a lot of you may know, that they've been exempt from medicals for all their operations, just like we are. But the FAA looks like they're going to move in on them and require second-class medicals for anyone operating a balloon commercially. Um, but right now, we don't have to have medical certificates for anything. So um, we don't have a free pass on the medical stuff in gliders. 
still have still have regulatory requirements. The other thing is um, the beginning. You guys went over schedules and uh, Medow didn't get mentioned, and that's that's an event that is SGC. It's an SGC event, and if anybody's wondering on the dates, I've kind of put those um, in the uh, SGC website, and also sent out a ton of emails. But I'm sure I missed somebody. <laughs> uh, um, but we're hoping to start it on Saturday, the 18th of June. And the last day would be Friday, the 24th of June. And the reason for those dates, uh, we didn't want to push up uh, right up against regionals, which the um, uh, formal practice day is going to be on Sunday, the 26th. So our last day of Medow will be Friday, the 24th. If conditions are good and we still have a tow plane around, um, then we could still potentially fly Saturday, the 25th. Um, so if we start on, on Saturday, the 18th, hopefully people would show up who are going to participate on Friday. So there are, people aren't showing up in Saturday morning when we're trying to have our um, first briefing. And if anybody has any comments about Medow, um, feel free to uh, email me. Um, or let me know one way or the other, call me, anything like that's fine. That's it. Thanks, Jim. Awesome, thank thanks, thanks Appreciate Brad. It, Brad. If I could just jump in, just FYI, I, uh, I just exchanged some messages with a couple of guys from um, California today, uh, the Bay Area. There's a, a real big distance pilot named Rami Yanitz, if you've seen any of his posts. Um, he's thinking about coming up to check out Methow. Uh, so I'll be putting him in touch with you guys soon. And he might also be hanging around for part of our regionals as well with uh, several other new um, new contest pilots from places like Reno and Ben. So we're shaping up for a, a fun summer out there come June. Yeah, hopefully we'll have uh, three tow planes <laughs> and and pilots. That, that could be our uh, Achilles heel, potentially. And we want the tow planes to be in good shape for the regionals too. Yeah, well, we always want the tow planes to be in good shape, period, not just for, not just for the events. So, yeah. Well, thanks. Uh, does anybody else have any uh, thing that they want to bring or any announcements? Well, if not, let's adjourn the meeting and we will talk with you next month. Thank you very much. Anyway, yeah, Matt, this is Matt. I was just going to say that I, you know, I was kind of a visitor at your um, in your club this year. I was up in Matt Town and stuff, and I was really impressed with your club and the operations and Brad and everything. And I've been trying to talk up your thing, and Rami got a, a word or two from me on it. So, um, yeah, I hope to be back up there to share that some time with you guys. This was a really great time last summer trying safari up there. Great. Sounds good. Well, thanks.